Chapter 9, Business Income, Deductions, and Accounting Methods. So in this chapter, we're going to describe the general requirements for deducting business expenses and identify common business deductions. We're going to apply the limitations on business deductions to distinguish between deductible and non-deductible business expenses. Identify and explain special business deductions specifically permitted under the tax laws. Explain the concept of an accounting period and describe accounting periods available to businesses. And then identify and describe accounting methods available to businesses and apply cash and accrual methods to determine business income and expense deductions. So if you notice, I keep saying business, business, business. And um, some of these apply right across the board for all businesses. Um, some of them, we're really just focusing on limited liability companies with a single owner and a sole proprietorship in our course. When you are a single member LLC, so you're the only owner of the limited liability company, or you are a sole proprietorship, you file a Schedule C trade or business income to report the income and allowable expenses in your business. So this would include your revenue from services and sales activities, gross profit from sales, you'll be deducting cost of goods sold because that's a return of capital item, that's an expense. And a business, um, business income does not include excluded and deferred income. So we'll be discussing that. Deductions must be directly related to your business activity. And here are the three key terms the IRS looks like looks at. Your business deductions must be ordinary to your business, necessary to conduct business, and reasonable in amount. And as we said, that's a facts and circumstance case in, um, I believe it was the last chapter where we look, or even the chapter before, and compensation, where we look to see, is that something normal given the amount of income? Is that a normal type of deduction for the industry? Rick owns a business that employs his brother Ben, right there, red flag, related party. Ben is paid $45,000 per year by Rick's business. Other employees with Ben's responsibilities are only paid $30,000. What is Rick's business deduction for employing Ben? Well, under the reasonableness amount, the 30000 would be the amount allowed. He could pay him as much as he wants, but he can only deduct 30000 as a business expense. The extra 15000 is a gift. So there's certain expenses that are not allowed to be deducted for business purposes. The first being expenditures that are against public policy. So if your business had to pay any fines for maybe not paying your taxes on time um, or filing your tax return late or speeding tickets or parking tickets, those kind of amounts, although maybe um, deductible for financial statement purposes are not deductible for tax purposes. Same with if your company bribes someone. Well, that's illegal. <laughs> so that is not allowed. Lobbying expenditures. Um, if you're paying for a lobbyist um, to influence a lawmaker's decision on how they will vote, none of those expenditures are allowed as a deduction. You could do it, but it's not allowed as a deduction. And any kind of political contributions, no matter if it's to the political party or a specific candidate, none of those are allowed as a deduction. When you have expenses related to tax-exempt income or income that's not taxed, let's say you have interest on a loan where you use the loan proceeds to buy municipal bonds. Well, we know the interest income on a municipal bond is not taxed. So interest on that loan would not be allowed as a deduction. Same with key employee life insurance premiums. So no deduction if the business is the beneficiary of the life insurance because when and if the owner passes away or the key employee passes away, the company will receive tax-free income. Capital expenditures. 
these are not deductible in the year you purchase. Generally, they are depreciated and we'll cover that in chapter 10. Personal expenditures. They're not related to your business, so they are not allowed as a deduction. And finally, business interest limitation, which we're going to take a look at. This is new. For most small businesses, it doesn't affect them, this limitation. They'll basically be able to deduct the amount of business interest expense they pay on loans. But we will show you where there may be limitations as to how much of the business interest paid on a loan will be limited. So capital expenditures, remember, does the expenditure provide future benefit beyond this year? So when we purchase an asset or pay for something, we ask ourselves, does it provide future benefit? Will we use it beyond a year? And if the answer is yes, we capitalize it rather than deduct it. Now, 12-month rule for prepaid expenses. We deduct if the benefit is less than or equal to 12 months, okay, and the benefits do not extend beyond the end of next tax year. So what we're saying here is, let's say on the December 1st of the current tax year, December 1st, December, um, December 1st, December 1st, December 1st of 2017, you prepaid your insurance for the coming year. So the insurance policy will run from 12-1 of 17 through 12-1 of 18. So you have a whole year's worth of insurance there. And you pay it on 12-1 of 17. Can you deduct it all? Well, according to this, if you are under the correct accounting, you can. You can deduct if the benefit is less than or equal to 12 months and the benefits do not extend beyond the end of next tax year. This insurance policy will be done by G December 1st of next year. This rule, though, does not apply to the prepayment of any interest. You only are allowed to deduct actual interest as it occurs. Ben is a cash basis taxpayer makes the following payments for on June 30th of this year. $10,000 for the next 10 months of utilities. $12,000 for insurance over the next 24 months. $9,600 for the next 8 months of interest on a business loan. So these are all prepaid expenses, which would normally be capitalized. It's a deductible. Well, Ben can deduct all $10,000 for the utilities because... This benefit does not exceed 12 months, and the benefit ends to prior to the end of next tax year. He can only deduct $3,000 for the insurance, the portion of the insurance that occurs in the current year. So the benefit exceeded 12 months. That's why. It, it was a two-year insurance policy he prepaid. So Ben can only deduct six months in this year. And Ben can deduct $7,200 for interest because the 12-month rule does not apply to interest. Let's take a look at our business interest limitation now. As I said before when we introduced this, we said generally most small, medium-sized businesses will not have any kind of limitation on how much business interest that they paid they can deduct. Why is that? Take a look at our first bullet. It doesn't even apply to any taxpayer with average annual gross receipts of $25 million or less for the prior three taxable years. So we look at the gross receipts of the company, we add up the three prior years, divide by three, and if that amount is less than $25 million, the limitations we're about to discuss do not apply. But what if they are more than $25 million? Well, the amount of business interest expense you paid that can be deducted is limited to your business interest income plus 30% of the adjusted taxable income. Now, what is adjusted taxable income? It is income computed without adding interest income 
subtracting interest expense or subtracting depreciation, amortization or depletion or net operating loss carryovers. So these items are either if they've already been deducted or added would either like the expenses, the deductions would be added back and the interest income would be subtracted. And then that is your adjusted taxable income, which would you take 30% of. Add that to your business interest income. That's the maximum interest expense you can deduct. Take a look at an example. This year, MH Inc. reported $1 million of taxable income on $50 million of revenue. Now, remember, it is the gross receipts, the revenue that we're looking at here um, in determining if the um, um, company has to limit their business interest e expense deduction. The revenue included $250,000 of interest income. In calculating their taxable income of $1 million, they had three forty dollars in depreciation and two ten dollars of interest expense. What's the maximum business interest deduction this year? So the amount of allowable business interest expense would be your taxable income, subtract any interest income, add back any depreciation or interest expense deducted to get to taxable income to determine adjusted taxable income of 1.3 million. 30% of that is 390,000. That plus the interest income of 250 would give you your maximum interest deduction. So if their business interest expense, the amount of interest they paid on loans, was more than 640,000, they would only be allowed a deduction of 640, and then they would be able to carry over the disallowed amount to the next year. Special business deductions on the losses of disposition, oops, got a tack on me, losses on disposition of business property. We recognize losses and they are deductible. Casualty losses are limited to the lesser of the decline in value, how much it costs to repair, or how much the basis is. Basis is amount of loss if business asset is completely destroyed. So let's take a look um, at an example. Here's what we're saying. Let's say you're business asset, um, your piece of equipment, caught on fire. It's completely destroyed. That's considered a casualty. So a casualty, or even if it was stolen, that would fall under this as well. And you have no insurance on it. Let's assume that for the first part. Now, what we do is we look to see how much did it cost to repair the equipment if it is in that condition that it could be repaired. And let's say it costs $10,000 to repair it. The next thing we ask is what is the basis of the equipment? Now basis we normally said was what we paid for it. But with businesses and these types of assets, it's a little more trickier than that. Because you'll see in the, when we look at cost recovery or depreciation, we record depreciation on equipment. So the basis is really the cost of the asset minus any depreciation taken on the asset. That will equal the basis. So let's say our basis in this asset is $6,000. What that second bullet is saying is you can get a casualty loss, but it's limited to the lesser of how much it costs to repair it or the basis, what's left to expense of this asset. So in our case, it would be the $6,000. If this asset was completely destroyed in a fire or stolen, there would be no repair cost. So you would be able to deduct the basis. So the lowest amount you can deduct um, when, it, when it's a complete loss is how much you still have left to expense of it or the basis, cost minus depreciation taken for taxes. Now, 
business expenses with personal benefits. So there's no deduction for purely personal expenditures. Here's what we're talking about. Let's say your business decides to donate to charity. That's awesome. But that's considered that the owner withdrew the money and paid that to charity. So the owner would put that as a charitable deduction on their Schedule A, the itemized area. Same with medical, or if they gave a gift. So it's the owner is looked at as withdrawing the money and then making that as a personal expenditure. These are not deductible on the Schedule C, but may be deductible as personal items elsewhere on the tax return. Mixed motive. Primary motives for some expenditure, all or nothing. Business travel away from home overnight. What does this mean? Well, if you are going on a business trip and it's purely business, you're going away overnight and away from home overnight means you're going away long enough that you need a rest. It does not mean you are away a full 24 hours. You're just long enough away that you need to sleep. You need to rest. Then you're in what we call business travel mode. Business travel mode, we are allowed to de um, deduct expenses if they are purely business. Now, let's say you go on a trip that you spend five days doing business, but you're in Las Vegas. So you spend two days gambling. The primary motive for your trip, because you spent more than 50% of your time um, in business, is business related. Here's the rule. When your primary motive is business, your expenses getting to and from, getting to and from, whether it's plane, train, bus, is fully deductible if the travel is within the United States. If it's the other way around, you spend two days in business and five days gambling, none, none of the travel to or from the destination is deductible because your primary motive was personal. Now, when you are away overnight and you're on the business portion of your trip, your lodging is deductible. Incidentals are deductible, like tips. So those two items are deductible. And 50% of your meals are deductible. 50% of your meals. On the personal portion, none of the lodging, meals, or tips would be allowed. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind. Otherwise, allocate deduction to business portion, and that's what we're talking about. You must keep documents of all this. Ben paid the following to attend a business meeting in Chicago. He flew airfare, first class, it doesn't matter, hotel, meals. What amount are deductible if Ben spent two days in meetings? Primarily business. What amounts are deductible if Ben spent one day in a meeting? Well, primarily business, all of his airfares deductible. His hotel for the two days that were in business are deductible. And $90 per day times 50%, or that should be $45 per day, two days, right? 50% of that would be deductible for the business side. The personal side, none of it's deductible. But that's how we would divide. Now, when it's primarily personal, None of the airfare. The hotel for one day, because he was only in business one day, and then, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. It is $90. I, I apologize. It is $90 per day. That primarily business column, two days is 180 times 50%. The, 40, <laughs> the second one, though, where it's primarily personal, $90 a day, but only 50% is deductible because it's one day. So that's how you would determine what is the allowable business deduction. Um, there's quite a bit of discussion, so you know, with regards to 
business and travel. Um, one thing I do want to bring out to you on page, um, it's under the travel area. If foreign travel is primarily for personal purposes, then only expenses directly associated with the business activity are deductible. So again, if you're going on a trip to France and it's primarily personal and you're, you know, three days business, or I'm sorry, three days personal, one day business, nothing's deductible as far as getting to or back. But while you're in travel mode and you're doing business, Business expenses associated with the travel within France would be. Meals are still limited to 50%. But if it's the other way, you're going to France on business for three days, one day personal. So four days in total, three days business. Three quarters of your travel to and from would be deductible. So it's not an all or nothing thing when you're traveling abroad. And they discuss that within that travel section of your um, chapter nine. Also an excellent example demonstrating these um, rules. Um, another item that isn't really brought out in the uh, PowerPoints is um, using your vehicle for business. So sometimes we use our personal vehicle for business purposes, or we have a business vehicle that we use for personal purposes. The um, question comes to mind of how much can we deduct when using our personal vehicle? And there's two ways to determine that. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't think we have a slide on this. So I'm going to count on you to take a few notes here. The two ways, the first way, and we're going to write this down, is called the standard mileage rate. And I believe we've had some um, experience with this so far in this class. The standard mileage rate is where we take a stated rate presented by Congress and for 2017 is 53 and a half cents. We take 53 and a half cents times our actual business mileage we use the car for. And we'll explain to you what business mileage is. Multiply that out and that's how much your deduction is for using your personal vehicle. Another way to determine your expenses and you could do these both calculations and then compare and take the greater is to keep track of all your actual costs of running using the vehicle. Gas, oil changes, maintenance. You can take depreciation on the car. So when we talk about how to determine depreciation, know that that is included. And we keep track of it for the whole year on 100% use of the car. Well, you're not allowed to deduct all those costs because you're not using your car 100% for business. So what you do is you take the ratio of business miles that you used your car for over total miles. And it's that ratio of the total costs that would be allowed as a deduction. Now that's a lot of record keeping and you are required to um, keep track of all of that as proof. Okay, but please keep in mind you can deduct that on the Schedule C, okay, either standard mileage rate or actual costs. Now what is business miles? That's important. Driving from your home to your tax home, which is your office, is not deductible business miles. That is called commuting. So your personal residence to your tax home, which is your normal office, your normal job, is commuting. Now, some people in business, in, in their own businesses, their home and their tax home are the same place. I have a brother who has that. His tax home is his home. And he paints for a living and he has an LLC. It's a single member LLC. Whenever he leaves his home and goes to a client's to paint, that is considered business miles business miles. Normally, um, if we have an office separate from our residence, any mileage from our office 
to a client or a customer's and back is considered business miles. And that's generally how you could look at it right now. So they discuss that in the travel and transportation area. So you want to take a read through that. Now, we've only looked at some deductible expenses and the ones we looked at so far are ones that are very common and the most scrutinized by the IRS because meals are very scrutinized and there's another component called entertainment. And that is talked about also in chapter nine. And entertainment is a business entertainment. Um, so you're conducting a meeting and there's some kind of entertainment involved. Maybe you took your client golfing or you took them to a show. So you're having meals, maybe a meal, and or entertainment. You took them to a baseball game right after a um, meeting or during a meeting or at a baseball game or right after the baseball game. You're having something business related. Then the cost of that times 50%. Entertainment is only 50% deductible. So the specific rules related to entertainment are also listed there. All right. Now, how do we report? How do we match income and expenses to a specific period? We talk about accounting periods. Most companies, most sole proprietors are in a full tax year, 12 months long. Sometimes, though, people ask their tax year to be changed. Let's say you're someone who, for whatever reason, your tax year has always been October 1st through September 30th, and now you want to change to a calendar year. Okay, so you file your tax return for 930 of 17 because that's the end of your full 12 months. You want your 2000 you want the calendar year 1 1 2018 through 12 31 2018 to be a your new calendar your new tax year. Well, there's some time between September 30th and January 1st. So from October 1st, 2017 through 12 1 31 of 2017, you have a short tax year. So this isn't happening all the time, but it's most common when you are changing your tax year. And that's what that means. Proprietorship is a proprietor. C corporations and individuals make a choice on made on their first tax return and they stay consistent with how they um, will look and complete their accounting year. Okay. Flow through entities have a required tax year. They have to match there. So partnerships and S corporations generally have to have the same tax year as their owners. S comparing financial and tax accounting. Financial accounting is conservative. That's your intermediate accounting. Gap is slow to recognize income. Wait till it's earned. But quick to recognize losses or expenses. And that objective of financial accounting, we don't want to mislead anyone. Tax accounting is much less conservative. We're quick to recognize income, but of course, because they want their taxes, right? But likely to defer deductions, as we saw with prepaid expenses. The objective of Congress is different, as we said, maximize tax revenue. So we got to keep that in mind. So we've talked about the different accounting methods from the income recognition, cat, um, but also we need to talk about them from the deduction side. So when it comes to cash method, we recognize income when we receive it, when the cash is involved. You can also choose to be an accrual taxpayer. You recognize income when earned or receive. Hybrid is a mix of accrual and cash. Hybrid is more um, cash related and it's and that's the method that's followed except for when it comes to accounting for inventory. You adopt your method with your first tax return. As we discussed in a prior chapter, large corporations must, they must use accrual. Under the cash method, income is recognized when it's actually or constructively received. 
So you will have revenue or income when you actually receive the cash in your hand or you constructively receive it, which means that it is available to you without any kind of limitations on it. A quick example of that is when you, your bank puts your interest into your savings account each year. If you don't withdraw that money, you don't have the cash in your hand. So why do you have to show the interest income on your tax return? Because you've constructively received it. It's in your account and it's available to you. There's no restrictions on it. So you constructively received it. It's just your choice not to take the money out. So that could get very technical. So you want to make sure you could really wrap your head around that. It's available and there's no restrictions. Expenses are generally recognized when you pay them. Now, there are some exceptions. I won't be looking at them. So what are the pros and cons of the cash method? It's easy. It's flexible. Simple, relatively inexpensive to use. It does have a poor matching of income and expenses. Here's the newest thing that's nice. It can be used by taxpayers with average annual gross receipts. Remember, there's your average gross receipts for three years of 25 million or less. So this is new with our new tax law. Corporations were not allowed generally to use this method of accounting. They just weren't. Now, if the corporation has 25 million or less on average over the past three years of gross receipts, they are allowed to use it. So we got to keep this in mind when we're dealing with clients. Accrual, on the other hand, is income is recognized when earned or received. And we follow what's called the all events test. We recognize income when all the events have occurred, which fix the right to receive such income. So we've done our job at the company and we have a right to receive the money and the amount can be determined with reasonable accuracy, even if we didn't get it yet. So the earliest of these dates that we would report income is complete service or sale, payment is due, payment is received. it would be $8,000. That's the amount we could have um, reasonably expect to get. Accrual, when it comes to prepaid income, remember these are advanced payments for services, so a customer's paying us before we've done anything. We're allowed to defer recognition for one year unless income is earned. So when we earn it, we recognize it except if it's a prepayment of rent or interest income. We recognize those immediately. When there's an advance payment for goods, we elect um, one of two methods. Um, inventory we're talking about here. Generally, and you'll see it on the second page of the Schedule C, the formula, the formula to determine inventory and what we sold will be your beginning inventory, beginning inventory. So what did you start the year with? Plus all your purchases, minus your ending inventory. And that will give you cost of goods sold, that expense, the cost. So how much did it cost the company for all the goods that were sold? Ben provides dancing lessons. On September 30th of this year, he receives 2400 full payment for a two-year service contract. What amount of income must Ben recognize? If Ben uses the cash method, he recognizes all of it. If he uses the accrual, he can elect to defer advances for services for a year. This year, Ben would recognize $300, the income earned for the last three months of the year. But next year, he'll recognize the remaining 2100 He can't let that gap over into the, even the following tax year. And that's what they mean by that rule. When it comes to inventories, generally they must be accounted for as if you're applying the accrual method if 
they are material income producing factor, meaning you're a merchandiser. But what about if you are um, a me mechanic in an auto parts store? And it's not considered, or not an auto parts store, but in a um, in your own little uh, garage. Well, if your annual average annual gross receipts for the past three years are 25 million or less, and your inventories are not a material part of how you make your money, so it's not how you basically make your money. You know, these are parts you have that you use, maybe you sell some, but that's not how you really make your money. Your money is providing a service. You do not have to recognize those items as inventory. You basically can treat purchases as non-inventory. So the purchases for the sale of those goods as non-inventory. So you don't have to fill out the back section of the Schedule C you could put those items in the supplies area. You're still going to keep track of your inventory, but you don't have to show it on your tax return that way. Now, cash method taxpayers can opt to use cash method for other non-inventory accounts as well. So this is something um, newer for those large, uh, you know, medium, small, medium um, companies. And this technique of what you're doing here is called hybrid method. Okay. When it comes to inventory, we could um, remove inventory under one of three or four different methods, and it's up to you. First in, first out. What we're saying here is that you could assume the first items that you brought into inventory are the first ones sold. So that's how you would remove them or put them into cost of goods sold. You can do last in. That's supposed to be last in, first out. Last in, first out. And what this is saying is that the last items you purchased or the newest stuff in inventory are assumed to be sold first. So when you sell something, you'll say, what's the last thing I bought? I'm going to put that into cost of goods sold. You also have specific identification where you can say, I sold this item. I know exactly how much I paid for that. So I'm going to put that cost into cost of goods sold. And you also have average costs you can choose from. When we're accruing business expenses, we ask ourselves, did we meet the all events test and the economic, economic performance has occurred? The all events test says this, all events in the contract have occurred to establish a liability to be paid. So we've received the service, we received the utilities, we received the advertising, we received the rents, and we owe it. The amount is reasonably determined. And it's there's no reserves allowed to pay future liabilities. So you had to have had the um, service um, occur. The other test, the economic um, performance test, and this is right out of your book, even when businesses meet the all events test, they still must clear the economic performance. Congress added this because in some situations, taxpayers claimed current deductions and delayed paying the associated expenditure for years. Thus, they got a great tax advantage there. Um, so what the economic performance test says is that an accrual method business would not be allowed to deduct a prepaid business expense even if it qualified to do so under the 12 month rule unless unless it also met the economic performance test with respect to the liability associated with the expense now what does that mean the liability arose from receiving goods or services from another party The liability arose from the use of property. The liability arose from providing goods or services to another party. Or the liability arose from certain activities creating payment liabilities. And the next couple pages explains 
each of those in detail with examples. So please read through them, post any kind of questions or email me. Economic performance applies to accrual method taxpayers only. Everybody else waits till they pay, right? Taxpayers provides goods or service. Performance occurs, and we're going to go through them really quick, occurs as the taxpayer provides goods or services. If the taxpayer is using property or goods, performance occurs so you could recognize the expense as goods are provided or economic performance is otherwise expected within three and a half months of payment. Payment liabilities are performed only when paid. So you can only recognize that as an expense when paid. You're considered economic performance. And under these circumstances, expenses related to interest and rent occur ratably over time. Let's take a look. Ben assigned a binding contract for Peter to provide Ben with repair services. Ben paid him $1,500 and owes an additional $6,000 on the contract. The repairs will commence late next year. When can Ben claim the deduction if he uses the accrual method? Well, although the all events test is satisfied, Ben can only deduct 7500 next year because that is when economic performance occurs next year. Choosing or changing an accounting method. Accounting methods are generally adopted by use. A permissible method is adopted by using and reporting it for one year. Okay. Generally, a method change requires the IRS permission. So if you wanted to change from cash to accrual or accrual to cash or cash to hybrid, you need, you need to seek permission from the IRS to do that. And there are special forms. Okay, so this chapter has great information about um, what a sole proprietorship can um a sole proprietorship or a single member LLC, some specific items that are deductible, how they would determine if something is allowed as a deduction overall, certain things that are not allowed, choosing an accounting method, um, and how there are special rules with each accounting method. So please go through this really well, this chapter. On page, on, I'm not sure what on your book. I have a different book in front of me. Same author. But there is a profit or loss. I know there is um, a Schedule C completed in your um, textbook. Please take a look at where all those different numbers come from and how to calculate the taxable profit or loss on a business.